Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Carrod Writer, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2018 biographical drama titled Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, Bohemian Rhapsody runs for 2 hours and 14 minutes long. It is directed by Brian Singer and Dexter Fletcher. It is produced by Graham King and Jim Beach. See, Brian Singer originally was to, to be the sole director, but then during the middle of the project, he eventually got fired due to several disagreements on the set and lack of dedication and lack of good ethic. So eventually, they eventually fired the director, and then to kind of pick up the pieces, uh, Dexter Fletcher kind of took over. Okay, the production, like I said, was Graham King and Jim Beach. The script was written by Anthony McCartan. The story it was based on was by Anthony McCartan and Peter Morgan. The music is, of course, uh, because this is a biographical movie based off of the life and career of Freddie Mercury. Um, the music is, of course, composed by Freddie Mercury and Queen. The cinematography was done by Newton Thomas Siegel, and it was edited by John Ottman, and the stars of the movie are Rami Malek, uh, Lucy Boynton, William Lee, Ben Hardy, Joe Mazzello, Aaron McCusker, Aidan Gillen, Alan Leach, Tom Hollander, Mike Myers, Jack Roth, Ace Batty, Maneka Doss, Priya Blackburn, and Kashmira Bulsara. In 1975, the legendary rock band Queen released their iconic hit single, Bohemian Rhapsody, a song that was badly discriminated by the radio stations due to the lengthy time the film clocks itself in, which I believe is kind of a bit of an injustice, because when you think about it, there are a whole lot of songs out there that seem to go exceed past the five-minute mark. I mean, when you think about a song like Hey Jude by the Beatles, that kind of like benches over the seven-minute mark. And then you get a, a classic, iconic 70s hit song called American Pie by Don McLean, which actually runs to the eight-and-a-half-minute lengthy song. And, of course, you know, then there's Traffic's Low Spark of High Heel Boys, which seems to go to about 11 minutes long. So I, I don't see the logic into why this song would be so discriminated against because of its lengthiness. But, hey, you know, there was really not much to do because the song kind of plays off as a ballad, and then it um, kind of like breaks into almost like a Gilbert and Sullivan minuet. And then at the end, it just breaks into some hard rocking guitar stuff that's symbolic for 70s rock music. So the combined song, like I said, is a bit of a baroque along with a Broadway musical, a 70s pop and raunchy hard rock in the middle. It was original in content and a song that shouldn't have worked but eventually turned out to be one of the best songs the group has achieved. Sure, they've done all kinds of other great songs like Flat Bottom Girls, You've Got a Friend, Another One Bites the Dust, We Will Rock You, um, Fat Bottom Girls, Killer Queen, you know. But still, Bohemian Rhapsody was their bread and butter. This was the one that got them the most notice and the most publicity. Even though a song like this would probably shouldn't have worked, but it did. It became very popular, and it made these guys into household names and, pro and approximately maybe one of the best bands in rock music in the 70s and even well carrying themselves into the 80s and even up until Freddie Mercury's death in 1991. And you know what? Even to this day, still to... Um, former members Brian May and Roger and drummer 
Roger Taylor. They're still they're still performing, you know, with uh, Adam Lambert. So you know, they're, they're they're still you know out on well they I guess you know because of the pandemic they're really not on the road but uh, they're still trying to keep themselves legit even though it's kind of a bit difficult in these times of these times but uh, you know they're still trying to you know stay within the public spectrum in their best capacity yeah I know they're kind of like a bit long in the face but hey I guess this is just their livelihood so why stop them but event the lyrics are definitely filled with gibberish random subliminal message that might stun even their most devoted fans but the main attraction is that the beat is catchy and might be etched in your memory for a very long time. I mean, I like the way how it builds up. Like, it starts off as almost like a bit of a rock ballad, and then it becomes like a Baroquean musical. And then all of a sudden, it turns at the end into like a hard rock edginess, and then it comes back to its um, 70s acidic fluid progression. I mean, when it comes to progressive rock, Queen is definitely up there. I mean, yeah, there are other bands too, like Genesis and Pink Floyd and Blue Oyster Cult, amongst many others. But Queen was definitely, like, right up there. The movie Bohemian Rhapsody itself is a film that clocks just past the two-hour mark which is quite short with modern biopic movies about musicians. But also, even though it was praised a lot by critics, and I think Remy Malek actually went on to win an Oscar for his performance, and, and maybe well-deserved, but I still felt the movie fell flat, and it feels that some important issues of the band's life were either left out, or were misinf misinformed. And even the main emphasis of the movie is not really about Queen. And that the emphasis was predominantly on the trials and tribulations that surround Freddie Mercury, played by Rami Malek. And less on the other band members, like their personal conflicts have little to no significance. This is one of the biggest flaws here was that, um, yes, it did feel flat at times. And there was quite a bit of misinformation. And the two biggest misinformed stuff had to do with, you know, Freddie Mercury leaving the band to pursue a solo career. And eventually, by the time they get to Live Aid, they have decided to, you know, almost at the 11th hour decide to reconcile their differences. No, that never happened. In fact, you know, when you think about a band's breakup, they always tend to think that, oh, bands break up on bad terms. Well, to be honest with you, for your information, for all these people who, who kind of worship this movie like it's all 100% accurate, it's not 100% accurate. To be honest with you, uh, Queen did not break up on bad terms. In fact, they all kind of praised and encouraged Freddie Mercury to uh, pursue a solo career. I mean, yeah, he was living in France and, uh, you know, just to start fresh and anew. So he decided to, you know, pursue a, a solo career. But that didn't necessarily mean that the other members were against it. In fact, many of the band members performed on a few of his solo stuff. But then again, they were also pursuing solo careers too, or doing solo material as well. Uh, Roger Taylor did a, a, a solo did a solo album in the late 70s. And in 1981, 
Brian May did a solo project as well. And yet Queen was still, you know, together as a group. And, you know, just because they sometimes break away to embark on, on solo endeavors did not necessarily mean that the group kind of like completely disintegrated. And John Deacon, the bass player, also participated on their solo projects as well. And they would come in and weave in and out of their solo projects as participants. So no, there was no ill intentions. There was no bad terms. And Freddie Mercury was not the first band member to pursue a solo career. The other misinformed thing was, you know, during that climax, which was to get the band together to perform for live aid, then we discovered that, uh, that Freddie Mercury is suffering from, from declining health because, uh, you know, he was dying of AIDS. No, that is not when he was first diagnosed with AIDS. Live Aid was in 1985 when, when Freddie Mercury was first diagnosed with AIDS. It was in 1987. That's when the news came about that... Uh, that he was uh, suffering from declining health due to AIDS. And he did not go out and tell his bandmates that he was dying. And that he didn't go out and tell the public that he was dying from AIDS until like pretty much around near the later stages of his life when he had to finally come out and admit and accept the fact that he wasn't going to stick around very long. So there was a lot of, of, of civil liberties, of misinformation that came within this, this, this movie. So, you know, it just goes to show you that not, not everything that you, that you watch in a movie is all 100% accurate. You have to go out and do some research. You know, in my many years of doing film critiquing, I don't just sit down, watch a movie, and forget about it, and just take everything that is given to me for granted. I do go out and I do go look for some research and some information that is actually more concise and more believable than what they're telling us. And it's not like I debunk movies or just dissect them just to make myself feel like I'm a lot smarter than than these people. But it's always good to do, you know, just always, you know, go out and look for for facts, your own facts, and not always just rely or depend on what they're they're feeding us. This is where the biggest thing was. Also, yes, I do, did mention that that the band Queen was pretty much all about Freddie Mercury. Like as if his life and his career mattered most. But I wished that they would have also emphasized a little bit more on the other band members. I mean, didn't they also had conflicts too? I heard Brian May had, you know, came from some troubled problems retaining to his abusive father. That's not really ever touched upon. Or the fact of the matter that, aside from him playing guitar for the band, he was also studying for his Ph.D. dissertation to become an astrophysicist. Because, in reality, Brian May can actually be labeled Dr. Brian May. He actually has a legitimate PhD. Also, Roger Taylor, you know, Roger Taylor has also had a bit of a of a significant uh, lifestyle too. You know, um, did you ever wonder that before the band eventually evolved to become Queen, they were actually a a group known as Smile. And the reason why it was called Smile was because Roger Taylor, the drummer of the group, 
actually prior to becoming a band drummer, he actually was seeking a career in dentistry. So, you know, this guy, see, these, these band members are actually quite highly intelligent. They're not just a bunch of lollygagging drifters. No. These guys are actually very highly educated. You know, John Deacon, the bass player, was an inventor. Plus, he also had a great sense of business savviness. Which is why, you know, even after the band's breakup, you know, with Freddie Mercury's death, you know, he was still, you know, being kind of like... Well, he kind of like was starting to slowly fade out. We wish we would have had some backstory about, you know, you know, after Freddie Mercury's life, how John Deacon kind of was like losing interest in his position as a musician, but was still, you know, like... Do you know, like while Brian May and Roger Taylor were performing gigs with other band members, he was still, you know, doing their accounting stuff, and that he actually has kind of like took to a more reclusive, um, you know, like stepping out of the spotlight because you know Freddie Mercury's death really touched upon him. I would have liked to have seen. A little more backstory about that too as well. And he also was a very successful inventor as well. You know, almost like a almost like a like a twentieth century version of Benjamin Franklin. Only, you know, Benjamin Franklin was American and John Deacon was British. <laughs> but you know, I would have liked to have seen a lot more emphasis on them. But instead, they were pretty much just pushed to the background. And were nothing more than just a bonafide backup group. Well, that's not the case. Every band member of the group, Queen, had just as much equal importance. They weren't just some one-dimensional background group. While Freddie Mercury just stole the show. Sure, Freddie Mercury was the guy whose magical voice made them famous. And yes, he was, you know, a larger-than-life character. But we also got to give credit to the other band members. And it just feels bad that Brian, Roger, and John are not given the equal amount of... of, of stories. It's pretty much the Freddie Mercury show here. The film as a whole is actually not very memorable, aside from the chiclet-looking teeth Malik wears might inject nightmares to you for a few days. You know, this is why I think this movie could be a bit overrated. Like most biopics of famous musicians, Bohemian Rhapsody falls down the same rabbit hole as other musician-themed biopics as it's told in a formulaic standpoint about the incredible rise to the inevitable fall of the band and the troubled life Mercury faced when he wasn't performing or rehearsing in the studio or touring the world and tearing the town red. Though some of the details may have been true, however, there are quite a lot of dramatic touches that might turn off fans to say that didn't happen like that. And they're not wrong in pointing that out. The film opens with a super spectacular Live Aid concert in 1985 where they just stole the show in their 20 minutes of airtime and performed their classic songs not just for themselves but for the charitable cause to help end starvation in poverty stricken Ethiopia. Then they go shift back to their humble early years as a group who didn't just want to make music, they wanted to create original content and by way of imagination and creativity. They would become one of the most successful bands of the 70s and 80s and after a few brief stints in bands like Ibex, Wreckage and Sour Milk Sea, Freddie Mercury would replace 
smile vocalist Tim Staffel, played by Jack Roth, who would make magic backed by guitarist Brian May, played by William Lee, drummer Roger Taylor, played by Ben Hardy, and later complete the roster with John Deacon, played by Joseph Mazzello, on the bass. Even though they say that the group was a trio by higher... No, John Deacon was actually a member of Smile. Tim Staffel was just a vocalist. Deacon was their bassist too. See, so that's where another inconsistency comes in. The issues surrounding Mercury's life are a bit scattered and fragmented as we see him in conflicting issues surrounding his Indian Parsi background, especially with his overbearing father, Balmy, played by Ace Batty, and his daughting mother, Jer, played by Menaka Das. His business and personal relationships within the bandmates shows a great level of teamwork as they work out of their songs, even while arguing about the arrangements of what to add or omit from each song. Of course, many people often like to emphasize a lot about the whole let it be, get back stuff with the Beatles and how sometimes they would work together as a cohesive, friendly environment. And Of course, many people often like to chat about, you know, the infamous argument that broke out between Paul McCartney and George Harrison over creative differences regarding the song Two of Us which actually was much more domesticated than some of the other conflicts that they've had in the past. But then again, you want to know about that's The Beatles weren't the only bands that used to argue about, about arrangements of what to add or, or omit from each song. A lot of bands did that. The Beach Boys were, were, notoriously, were notoriously bad for for arguing over how each arrangement or vocal or style was coming about. And there was a lot of like conflicts and egos, especially between the songwriting duos, mainly of Mike Love and Brian Wilson. Uh, it happens too with the Rolling Stones, with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. You know, many times that they've also had their share of arguing and conflicts. And sometimes they would lead to to more explosive stuff too. I mean, they've gone into to to fights amongst each other, both mentally, both verbally, and also, yes, I hate to say this, there were also a few physical confrontations as well. CCR was noted for that too, you know, which of course led to, you know, you know, like member rhythm guitarist and older brother of John Fogarty, Tom Fogarty you know, leaving the band because because John Fogarty wanted to make CCR the John Fogarty show. Since he practically did everything, write all the songs, sang most of the songs, played guitar. He was the lead guitarist. He was the great creative mind, while everybody else just pretty much got little to no commission or too much credibility for their for their contributions. You know, ego does play a bit of a of a pivotal role through every band, and Queen is not the only one. They argue. I mean, bands argue all the time. The Gallagher Brothers of Oasis, they practically argued with each other too. They practically even sometimes even got physical. And, and you know, I don't condone you know, any kind of physical violence or any kind of even verbal conflicting, you know, or insult somebody to hurt their feelings. Still, you know, that's just a business. And sometimes, yes, people say, say random shit that does not always sit well. But you know what? You stop, you take a deep breath, and you just, you know, go about. It's business as usual. Sometimes people agree, other times people don't agree. All natural. But aside from that, there are also plenty of memorable scenes where the band 
with struggling to get the symbolic song Bohemian Rhapsody on the air. And then we get the we get them, you know, like trying to, you know, do the arrangements, you know. There was this one memorable scene where where Roger Taylor was was struggling to reach those high almost falsetto voice to to the song Bohemian Rhapsody and you know he was just really really you know the more the more higher his voice kept going the more Freddie would be like not not like feeling it and you know you know he was I mean he was getting like really pissed through his fucking mind and you know Roger Taylor was almost like at his wits end you know, like, I can't go any more higher. How far, how high do you want me to get? You want me to think that, you know, my wife was knitting my pants and she accidentally sticks a, a needle straight up my asshole and I scream to the top of my lungs? You know. So, you know, there was a lot of, 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 of material that had to be covered to make Bohemian Rhapsody one of the great staple songs of the 70s. And then, you know, while the creative processing was was coming on hands, you would get other great exciting moments of like when they were doing the rhythmic sounds of We Will Rock You or the time when the band was having an argument. Then all of a sudden, John Deacon pulls out his bass and starts performing that funky bass to the... Do do another one bites the dust bump 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 another one bites the dust you know because you know they they were trying to you know like appease to all genres I mean one minute they would do like the musical type of Bohemian Rhapsody to almost a funky disco sound of another one bites the dust some of those scenes were pretty much the best scenes and it will definitely spark some interest. And there's actually a nice catalog of songs featured here, which is surely enough to make any Queen's fan satisfied. But you know what? You know what? I know something about Queen. Their music was never about logic or anything virtually complex. It was all about sounds, rhythms, and innovative creativeness. That's what made Queen such a successful band. They were about lifting spirits at times when things were rough. And sure, the instrumentation was catchy and original, but it's the angelic voice of Freddie Mercury that carries the group. Unfortunately, the script of the movie is where the red herring lies and it's mainly because it's pretty much by the numbers and really adds nothing new to the format. It's basically Malik copying both the physical and the psychological quirks that Mercury possessed from his outstanding delivery on stage to his cry for help at times when loneliness in his private life or like he would spend many numerous days by himself without the band members and it's like you kind of feel for him that the loneliness and the isolation that surrounds him when the band is not around or when they're taking time off to spend time with their families. You can see that he doesn't really have much of a family because they pretty much do not approve of him or his music. So he was pretty much, you know, alone most of the time. And that's kind of, you know, you feel for that. But you get to actually, you know, gravitate towards him, you know, as a sympathetic individual. You may think that the guy might be full of life. But the only reason why he also used to throw wild parties and and stuff like that, even just inviting strangers into his house 
was because it was just this way to conceal his loneliness. And, and that's kind of like could have been also the main contributor to his inevitable downfall. It wasn't just the fact that he was dying from AIDS. He was also, you know, living a bit of a rough shot style. So, it, under the script of writer Anthony McCartan and the direction of Brian Singer, later replaced by Dexter Fletcher, which is another thing that went wrong, is that, you know, after Brian Singer was fired and then Dexter Fletcher came in to pick up the pieces, you know, that's where you get um, a lot of, um, of things that just don't seem to mesh well. They seem to definitely take the liberty and the use of the story off of showiness and flamboyance, but we never fully concentrate on the troubling conflicts that happen in Freddie Mercury's life. Such issues include his struggles with the press who constantly hound on him and questioning about his sexual orientation. Like, that really gives a fuck. He tries to conceal his claims, but in the end, these angles featured were you know, kind of look out of place, incoherent, and never really thought of. Yes, there were people who questioned about whether the fact he was gay or straight. Well, okay, to me personally, Freddie Mercury conventionally was a homosexual. I mean, there was no doubt about it. Mercury was gay. But even though he was gay, it didn't actually mean that he did not have sex with other women, too. Did that make him bisexual? No, he was homosexual with hetero curiosity. That's how kind of like I would probably put it in better words. I mean, Mercury was at one time engaged to a young lady who was actually his soulmate. Yes, it just goes to show you that homosexual men do have female do have female soulmates, they could. And, uh, you know, her name was Mary Austin, who, even though he ended their engagement, they still remained on very close terms. The actress who played Mary Austin was Lucy Boynton. And though they were engaged, they never made it to marriage, though they were soulmates. And even after Mary went on to get married to another man and she went on and had kids of her own. The relationship, though, was badly compromised because of, you know, aside from his relationship with Mary Austin, he also had numerous relationships with men. And though they tried to tackle the issue with sensitive intentions, it's pretty much poorly structured because they didn't know how to go about this issue without offending anyone. They wanted to try to keep it clean and PC, but it's actually much, much hard to do. His relationship with Paul Prenter, played by Alan Leach, also served as his personal manager, may show some levels of intrigue, but sadly they make Prenter out to be an unreliable, conniving exploiter, kind of almost like the villain in the story. I mean, do all biopics even necessarily need a antagonist? I hardly think so. Which makes Mercury out to be a vulnerable man who makes poor choices in his life, when really he wasn't. He was an intelligent individual. See, this is where the whole misinformation about his life comes in. And while it does focus a little on his declining health due to due to AIDS, it's not overly done, which is quite relieving, but like I said, it wasn't during the time when he was performing for Live Aid, during the Live Aid concert back in 85, his uh, AIDS news came about in 1987, so that's very, very poorly mistimed there. And though it had its share of flaws, so overall this movie had its share of flaws, 
like a poor script and fragmented issues in Mercury's private life. I'm going to say it's not a bad movie. I mean, it had a nice catalog of Queen songs that one could enjoy if you're a diehard fan of the band Queen. And though the acting was good, Malick's performance might be a little bit over the top in its delivery from his from his chiclet teeth to his mannerisms, which seems more comical than dramatic. You know, he still pretty much was Oscar worthy. And the best scenes were when the band is performing and rehearsing. The scenes relating to his relationships, though, were very poorly structured because they were very fragmented and not very well developed and may even sometimes border on offensiveness. So though it was praised by the fans, and I thought it was good, but I still thought it was a bit overrated. So if you're going to see it, go ahead. But just don't get any high expectations, and don't think that everything that was featured on the film the way it was. You may have to just go do some research to go and further dig into the Queen bio biographies, check Wikipedia, check other sources of information to get a better look at Queen's life because you'll probably find more there than in this movie. So, with all that said and done, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I would give... Bohemian Rhapsody, a 6.5. I know, that might sound a bit cheap. But, I just was, I just that, I was coming in with high expectations, only to come out a bit disappointed. So, I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And now we'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Rudrider saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.